I'm going to present a brief overview of exactly how we got to the idea that the speed of light is constant for each observer. Now, this is an overview. We're not going to be able to get into a lot of great detail, but if you go in and study each of the individuals that I mentioned here, and even a few that I don't, you'll see how it all kind of comes together. And that's really what my goal is here, is to get you from the point of view of where we understood how fast light was to exactly how light behaves, how we got all of that figured out. So I wouldn't consider this a crash course. I would just consider this a guidepost for the people and the events you should be looking at to get a clear understanding of how we got into things like relativity. Okay, our first three individuals are Galileo, Ole Romer, and Newton. What we want to remember that uh, Galo contrib uh, Galileo contributed to this is that he said that speed or rate is measured between two objects, and we all know this. However, unfortunately, we tend to sort of truncate the last important bit off every time we say a speed limit on a highway. For instance, here in America, a lot of times there's 65 miles per hour well, that's relative to the road. So right there, his relativity stands that you're measuring things and other speeds of other devices and stuff from that position, from that observational platform that you happen to be in in a car. So that's the first idea that relativity, Galilean re relativity, was between two objects. Um, Romer was the first to study uh, objects in space and decided that uh, he could estimate the speed of light from his studies of Io and he determined, it was a little bit off, about a quarter, you know, off, by, uh, um, that it was 2.2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Well, we think it's closer to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But he came very close, and he was really estimating the speed of light to be very fast, a very, very quick clip that hadn't been nailed down before to that, to that level. So we give him a lot of credit for that. Now, Newton looked at light as well, and he decided that it probably behaved like a particle because of the way it casts shadows and so forth. But we're going to go away from Newton's point of view on that. We're going to kind of drop back over to the idea of it being more like a wave from here on out, as you'll see in a moment. These next three individuals are absolutely giant, but we're going to get right down to the parts that carry us on in the story. Ampere helped us determine the permeability in a vacuum for magnetism and we now use this mu sign, mu sub naught, at Henry's per meter to measure it. But there's a specific value for that. And this little constant is going to become handy in the next part of the story, as well as the permittivity of electricity in a vacuum. And it has epsilon naught, Faraday's per meter. And it has a value as well. I'm not going to spell it out for you, but these are constants. And these two constants come up later for Maxwell, and they were very important. Um, Faraday came along, and he discovered that these uh, mag magnets created these lines of force, such that he wondered if a signal could be passed through those lines. In other words, if those lines would be moved in some way, would they send a wave through those field lines of force? One of the questions he had. And that question gets answered by our next person, and he uses all of this information. It's Maxwell, by the way. So, again, we want the uh, constant of vacuum permeability, the constant for vacuum permittivity, and some of the ideas that Faraday, Faraday first proposed. That carries us on into the next part with Maxwell. So now we get to Maxwell in the 1800s. During his equations, he uses these two constants in a under a radical and the inverse of it and discovers that we get to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But the one question he really doesn't have is relative to what? kind of just shows up right there as a number, it's a true number, it is the speed of light, so he knows that now his electromagnetic waves include light, the speed of light has been nailed down, but he doesn't really know what we're measuring that speed to, 
because you, Galileo would say you need these two items. Well, it's just meters per second. Just like when we say we're doing 65 miles per hour, that's not the whole story. We're doing 65 miles per hour to the road in America. And we should be doing kilometers per hour, but sticking with the theme here, I guess. Um, so this question doesn't really get answered in Maxwell's time. Shortly afterward, it starts to uh, allow others to formulate some opinions of what it could be relative to. This is his displacement curves, current, so you'll want to get up on Maxwell, of course. Now, Lawrence was one of the more powerful physicists during his time. He ended up being good friends of Einstein, so he was by no means a small potato as a scientist. He was well respected, and in fact, later some scientists like Nicholson Morley were a little frightened by what their experiment showed because. Lawrence proposed that speed of light was propagating through an ether. It's sort of a rigid fluid that we could somehow pass through. Really, the whole framework of space had sort of a rigidity to it, but yet it was also a fluid that we could pass through. Very strange substance. And it would be an absolute frame of reference which would give the speed of light something to travel through. So now we're going to go on and have that tested. So since we have a framework of space that we should be passing through, we can set up a very sensitive interferometer, interferometer to see if light passing through two different pathways picks up any interference with itself to prove that this sort of ether is uh, being passed through. Well, their experiment showed that they couldn't find any evidence of the ether. Uh, again, what it was was an interferometer with two pathways, 90 degrees to each other, when you do your studying on that, you'll see what I'm talking about. And they were unable to confirm the existence of an absolute frame of reference. So now we've got to go back to that question that was sort of proposed by Maxwell. What is the speed of light relative to? It's just 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. But like I said, that's not the complete story. You have to say relative to blank. Well, we still need someone to fill it in for us and explain how that works. Lawrence comes back into the picture in some respect, along with another mathematician from France, and says, wait a minute, Mickelson Morley, we're going to take a look at your experiment. Now, the experiment was supposed to be, the speed was supposed to be uh, one speed in one direction and a slightly less speed in another direction in the speed that you're going. You didn't find that. You found the speed was the same in both legs. We propose that the leg in the path that you are going, that we're turning, the Earth is turning in, that leg was actually contracted some. And we've done some math, and we find that at these speeds, we should be uh, able to shrink back that path a little bit. It was called a length contraction Lawrence transform, and he did the math for that. So there wasn't all agreement that Mickelson Morley was right that the ether wasn't there. In fact, even Mickelson Morley thought very hard that they must be wrong. They felt that they had failed. And I guess Lawrence wanted to sort of defend his position that his ether still existed because he worked hard to try to find a way. Um, I don't know if I'm really correct on this, but it seemed as though he was trying to find a way to prove that he was still correct. But I'm sure there's more to it than that. And again, if you investigate it, you'll see what I'm getting at. Um, this is where the Lawrence transforms come in. They actually come in before Einstein. Einstein might have had the same sort of uh, transformations in his equations for the different points of view involved, but it was really brought up first by Lawrence. And as I said before, Einstein and Lawrence knew each other very well. Einstein really respected Lawrence and looked at the material and sort of broke new ground. <laughs> when I say sort of, I mean in a major way. He didn't look at it as ether or the length contraction having anything to do with what Lawrence was saying. He held on to length contraction and, and actually proposed this idea of time dilation. And I'll get into that to in a second. But really what he was basically saying is the speed of light isn't measured against the framework of space. It's relative to the observer. All observers, any observer, no matter what the observer is doing, no matter how fast they're going, 
the speed of light that they're witness to will be that speed, three times 10 to the eight meters per second, no matter what, no matter how fast they're going toward the source or away from the source or whatever, let's take and try to consider that light must be relative to the observer, all observers. And using that idea that the speed of light is going to be the same, same number for any observer, I have a new situation here having two observers. One is on board a system where there's a pair of mirrors and we're bouncing a light back and forth between mirrors. So this number one viewer, he's kind of attached to these two mirrors or he's with these two mirrors. The other observer is off in the distance somewhere watching as this thing sits. Right now it's just sitting later, it will be moving. So this observer and presently this observer both watch the light bounce back and forth over this distance say it's about 30 centimeters, and it happens to bounce back and forth in about, or bounce once across in about a nanosecond, a billionth of a second. That would be about the speed of light for about 30 centimeters. Uh, but again, both these guys' view on this match, if they could recount what they saw, they would have clocks and information that matched. They would say that it bounced from here to here at the same time. Time stamps would match. But now let's take a look at what happens when this system, the two mirrors and this one observer, are zipping by the other observer at the, near the speed of light. We're going to get this fellow's point of view of that whole thing in the next picture. All right, this is a single static shot of our system before with the light bouncing back and forth, but now this whole thing is shifting to the right near the speed of light. So this path is going to have to come down at an angle for this fellow, for the fellow who's not on board, he's watching it go by. I don't know how the heck he catches all this at, these, at this incredible speed or how the light waves get to him, but the information would be such that now the speed of light being the same for this guy as it was for the other guy, it has a longer distance this time. You know, if we were inside of a truck bouncing a tennis ball back and forth and we were driving on the road, if we drove a little faster, the tennis ball back and forth we wouldn't probably notice much of a difference on the outside versus the inside, but that's because we're not at the speed of light. The speed of light is the same for all users according to Einstein's postulate there, and if that's going to be the case, now this longer path at the same speed that we were taking to go here is going to take longer. So they're not going to agree now on the same event. The guy on board believes that the in a nanosecond it has gone to here, the uh, other mirror, and for the other fellow, in one nanosecond of launch, it only gets to about here, part of the arc of a circle. From this point here, it would be about something like here. It hadn't made it to this other plate yet. So their stories of the same event are going to be different, and they're not lying. They're seeing two different things because of the motions involved and the way light for each of them is said to be the same 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So that was the beginning which allowed Einstein to carry on and produce the special theory of relativity. And then from there, he took a look at a guy falling inside of a box, basically. And if there was a light sh shooting across that wall, as it fell this time, the light beam would seem to take a curved path. And that gave him this idea that space must be curved as well as time is dilated. Borrowing all the ideas that Lawrence mentioned with uh, the transformations, but he uh, arrived to a different idea, and the idea of space-time being a reason why we have gravity, you know, bent space-time. All of that stuff is for you to research. In this overview, though, I want you to see how we got to this situation where the one mirror system had a one result, the other, the very same setup in motion gives the other fellow who's off off the uh, off to the side gets a different result. He sees a different result because it's a longer distance and we're using the same speed. You know. So that's how that happened. And you see from the from the uh, other fellows before how we arrived to this situation. And that's it. That's kind of my overview of special relativity or the beginnings of it. 
And I'm sorry if I didn't hit every exact detail. I'm a little nervous. I'm not really familiar with speaking on a formal topic like this. But I think this overview is useful in the fact that it gives you the, some of the key people you need to look at what they said and really drives home the point that Einstein twisted and turned around on its head some of the ideas that Lawrence had and did a better explanation of how the universe works. Again, thank you for your time.